Today on the Move Daily Health Podcast, we welcome special guest, Lara Bloom. Lara is the president and CEO of the Elders Danlo Society and responsible for globally raising awareness of rare, chronic, and invisible diseases, specializing in the Elders Danlo syndromes, hypermobility spectrum disorders, and other related disorders. Lara is also an academic affiliate professor of practice in patient engagement and global collaboration at Penn State College of Medicine and is a member of the International Consortium for EDS and Related Disorders. She is a published author in various round journals, a seasoned speaker at conferences worldwide, and regularly works with umbrella organizations lobbying at the government level internationally. This quick bio is just the tip of the iceberg, and we're incredibly excited to have Laura on the podcast today. Laura, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. We uh, would love to inform our guests a little bit more about what you do. And we know that awareness, or we've seen that awareness around EDS and uh, HSD has really grown in the last several years, in large part to all of the efforts being done by organizations such as the EDS Society or EDS UK, which you, based on our understanding, were also running for uh, quite a number of years. Can you speak to some of uh, the evolution of that awareness because you've been behind so many of those campaigns and uh, it, it ranges just for our listeners from like education for professionals and support for people with these rare conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is my 14th year working in this field and it's gone quick and much has changed. It's been a long time since I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed at the age of 24 in 2004 and at that point, that was still the time where, for sure, if you'd go to a doctor, they would be Googling what EDS was. No one had really ever heard of it. The understanding and the knowledge about it, even from those in working in the field, was nothing like it is now. There was just really the understanding of the comorbidities and, and what they are and how they relate to the condition. So it was, it was a very different time when I was diagnosed. And I kind of fell into doing what I'm doing. It, it was meant to be a couple of years while I was doing a second degree. Um, and I, I started that second degree because I knew I needed to pivot my career. And I was a photographer previously and I was struggling a lot to stand for long periods, carry heavy equipment. And I knew the kind of trajectory of what I wanted my uh, career goals to be would need to change. And I think a lot of people struggle that. When, when coming to a diagnosis. And I really wanted to kind of stick two fingers up to that and take it, take back the ownership and make that a positive thing. So I went back to university at the age of 30 and studied global politics and, and, and international relations as my second degree. And I started working, I started running EDS UK in that period of, of the degree. And that was my plan to leave when I graduated. But here we are 14 years later and I, I, haven't, um, I haven't left the field. So it, it made me realise how much there was to do, how much need there was and how many fantastic people there were working um, around these conditions. And I think when I started running EDS UK, even that was a very, very reactive, small support group. Um, run out of a church hall really uh, mainly volunteers they didn't really have any staff I was the first um, proper member of staff and I started running it from the end of my bed in my bedroom and when I left there was an office and a team of six people and it became I think almost the second maybe the, one of the biggest EDS charities in the world um, and it was great but I was frustrated because there was a real ceiling on what you could do nationally and I realized that if we were going to really make systemic change, we needed to look through a global lens. And so I approached EDNF, which was at that point the U.S. organization. I, I sat on their board as an international expert and said, you know, what do you think about starting a global organization? And they said, you love it. Let's do it. And they were incredibly supportive and visionary um, alongside me and what that could look like. And in 2015, we spent that first year kind of trying to build it as an independent organization and realized very quickly we were going after the same donors, the same doctors, and it made sense to relaunch the EDNF as the Elders Danlos Society and with a new global vision. So that's what we did in 2016. And everything's just moved and changed very, very quickly since that point. We, we as an organization have grown tremendously 
we're I think now at 35 or 36 members of staff from all around the world which still blows my mind when it was just me and one other person part-time just a short time ago um and yeah lots of change lots of reasons to be hopeful but unfortunately we had decades of neglect to heal and that took longer than I think anyone expected but the last two to three years and of course we then had a global pandemic to challenge us further but I think in the last few years we're really starting to see um, a, a move forward. We've we've noticed that and I you mentioned the pandemic one of the things that's really impressive about what we've been able to see as far as like what's being produced is that you were able to do that despite the fact that like everything had to change at the drop of a hat in fact we were in the UK when the pandemic happened yep. and the borders were closing and we we're like uh-oh <laughs> uh what do we do now are we going to make it home um and and the noise online is something that really increased in the pandemic and I just mean noise in terms of things that perhaps weren't entirely helpful um that can cloud you know clearer signals and i'm borrowing that phraseology from one of the researchers um that we know here what is it that you had to do and i know this is a bit of a loaded question as um you know a member of the eds society to pivot and use that opportunity because you do so much in person work from what we've seen so obviously that had to stop for a time what is it that you had to do to pivot to still manage to produce so much like including the EDS echo program that came out of uh, that the last few years um, and it's quite impressive we think um, to be able to to like navigate those times when literally everything had to change yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Um, we we like to see challenge as opportunity. Well, I certainly do. Um, and COVID-19 was a huge challenge to the world and not least nonprofit organisations. And as I said, we've, we've got quite a large team. Probably in 2020, March 2020, we maybe had 20 or so members of staff. And we've always been a virtual organization pre-pandemic. We like all of our funding to go into our mission and not bricks and mortar. So every year, twice a year, we bring our staff team together to work together. And in February, we were in London with the staff team planning our next European in-person conference in Paris, which was to take place in April. And we sat around the table and, you know, news was building and people were starting to kind of postulate that this may actually turn into something that completely changes life as we know it and instead of waiting for that to happen we we predicted that it would happen and we decided to take advantage of that time when we were together around a table to change everything and that change firstly meant being one of the first trailblazers in the concept of a hybrid um or sorry a fully virtual um conference and then later you know as we we came out of lockdown, the hybrid model. And we attracted, I think, almost one and a half thousand people from all over the world in that first conference. And and I'll never forget it. We were, I was at my event director's house and we, you know, we, we were trying to find an area that was big enough that we could capture the screen and the sound. And we turned her keyboard upside down as a desk. And we had all these laptops and all everyone virtually trying to make it work and it did miraculously um I mean we were winging it and we had 1500 people dialing into this it was just mad and we realized very quickly this is not a short-term thing and we need to professionalize our virtual offering and it also made us realize how stupid we were that we hadn't been offering this more because so many of our community are restricted by their limitations, whether it be physically, financially, geographically, to get to our events in person. And this was such an inclusive opportunity to get people uh, to be able to hear firsthand from experts and what the latest is. So we just saw that challenge as an opportunity and we, we sat with our community education team and we said, okay, we need to completely ramp up the amount of virtual support calls we're doing. We need to do COVID specific ones. We need to do them across all different time zones. And we were just almost like a, a crisis group for people to vent their fears. And there were many. No one knew what this meant for EDS, for any chronic conditions. Were we more at risk? Should we get the vaccines? All these questions. 
And we had a COVID-19 landing page that went out into the science, into the into our support, into our events. And that was constantly evaluated by our um, scientific team and, and our healthcare professionals. And we worked with our physiotherapist to provide movement um, opportunities for people that were at home. And suddenly we were like, you know, why did it take a pandemic for us to do these things when it was so needed beforehand? So, you know, COVID-19 challenged us, but it really allowed us to grow and diversify and become much more inclusive as an organization. Is that <clears throat> um, you're working towards a time when geography is, is no longer a limit. Um, so the pandemic, mm -hmm. I don't know if that was <clears throat> part of the mandate before the pandemic or if that came about after, uh, but the, I'm sure the pandemic really fast-tracked that. Um, and I know you personally, you are uh, a patient expert or somebody who is an expert in patient engagement. And so to be connected to anyone who does have EDS or any of these other spectrum disorders um, is absolutely crucial, whether that's in person or, you know, uh, via Zoom or however you need to connect. So can you elaborate just a little bit um, and shed some light on how the demand for patient experts has changed in the last decade or so? Well, I mean, it's changed in many ways, not least of all what we call it. So it's taken decades for the term patient expert to really come to acceptance and become a norm. And just as that happened, we decided to change it. Um, there's a global movement to move away from using the term patient wherever possible. Because you're only a patient when you're in front of a doctor and you're a human and you're a person experiencing life with a condition both at the hospital, but also in your relationships, in your educational you know, framework, in your jobs, so many different things. So we're, we're moving much more now to uh, a person with lived experience. And that doesn't have as much of a, a snappy term. But when we say patient expert, and I think that that will probably stay to an extent because people understand what that means, not least of all pharma and industry who have seen it as a tick box for so many years. And I think we're finally at a stage where people understand that you need to be an equal stakeholder and the compensation needs to be the same. And patients are far more than than just data. And, you know, I lecture at, in, in various places as, as a professor um, in patient engagement. And it still astounds me, even sometimes after a two hour lecture. And I think I articulate myself quite well. I, you know, am desperately trying to get across this importance and the meaning of, of including people with lived experience and at what point they should be included. And sometimes still at the end of it, you know, I ask questions to find out if people have understood it. And it's like, yes, patients should be included because it will help the data. It will help the publication. It will help funding. And I'm just like, oh, my God. And, you know, it. it you think that in 2024 and with the amount of buzzwords around patient engagement, patient expert, patient inclusivity, all these things that it, it would become much more of a norm, but people still don't get it. So. It's evolving, yes. It's better than it's ever been, yes. But my goodness, there's still a long way to go. Whether it's Heller's Danlos or any other type of invisible illness, just, uh, just being believed and being heard and being seen is so vital, right? So it's um, people understanding what this means is pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're far from therapeutics, gene, gene therapy, you know, all of these things, but we're not far from people just being validated and believed and that can happen anywhere around the world no matter who you are and where you live and so we're really trying to push that the basics that can be done are done and I think always tapping into the people living with this to check out what is important with them will help people steer in the right way. I think just on the topic of being believed I've often told people uh, who don't have the conditions that it's not important that you understand from like a lived experience it's important that you believe um because yeah. then that can develop this greater understanding of like oh okay you can look perfectly healthy but you 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 do have a different sort of you do need to take a different approach to learning for example like learning online and being able to modify the way in which you you do acquire that information or the way in which you move has to change even the way in which we work I've known so many people um with mm. EDS or HSD who've needed myself included who've needed to change the way in which we work to be able to still keep working and then others who've unfortunately 
lost a lot of hope and really are, are at a loss. But a lot of that comes from uh, not having that initial step of validation. So I do wonder, you've worked in uh, many countries and you're part of a global alliance. Have you noticed that there are differences in, in needs for patients in uh, or people in the US versus in the UK? Because I know that there's a um, like a European branch of EDS Echo and a North American one, and some of that may simply be due to time zones and availability. But I wonder if there is also a little bit of a difference. Uh, we personally work with people in uh, Canada and the US and, and some in the UK and have noticed a little bit of a difference in terms of uh, what they have accessible to them. But I do wonder within all of the surveys that you do and all the engagement you do with, with people living with these conditions, if you've noticed themes come up that are being addressed differently and need to be addressed differently in the US versus the UK um, just by proxy of the healthcare systems being so vastly different? <clears throat> yeah, there's definitely differences. One thing I'll say is there isn't a country in the world that's got it right currently, um, which is depressing. Um, every country has its challenge um, and other countries have it have where they're winning. You know, in the UK, we have the NHS at the moment. There's very little available in the NHS. If you're in Scotland, Ireland, Wales, for example, there's nothing really. Um, there's a couple of champions out there that are fighting hard, but they're battling against the bureaucracy of, of things like the NHS. So funding is always a problem. You know, in the US, we've got the US health insurance structure, which is, you know, a whole minefield in itself. And then you've got countries around the world like Africa and Asia where there's you know so many people living with it and zero experts to to be able to to diagnose them let alone manage them so every country has its discrete challenges and issues you've also got culturally different things so in the in Europe and the UK it's usually geneticists um sorry rheumatologists that diagnose um and rarely geneticists to the point where actually geneticists no longer see people with heads and HSD um, whereas in US, it's still largely geneticists at the moment that are seeing uh, patients, although that too is changing. Um, so, I, you know, something like the echo structure, we didn't just, you know, the leading reason was time zones, but also to capture those different geographical barriers and solutions and the things that people are doing. I think you also find different expertise. So in the UK, for example, there's not a single surgeon that's willing to uh, operate on any CCI or um, Chiari issues, instability issues. So people have to pay self-fund to go to places like Barcelona or the US. Now in the US, so you'll see there's hardly any patients in the UK that have had that surgery. Look at the US where there's many surgeons, there's a lot more. And so, you know, that's different in itself. There's a much stronger GI group in the UK. So you see a lot more people on TPN and things like that in the UK, although that is now catching up in the US. So it is different. Um, and it's interesting, that difference for sure, because it doesn't really make sense. Um, but it also makes our job as a global organisation incredibly challenging because you can't just make one change systemically. You have to make those systemic changes in each country and based on their governments and their structures and all of those things. So it makes the battle on the mountain even higher. Unfortunately, <laughs> but so worth it when you can climb a little bit further, further up. Um, now, you know, you have lived experience and you have experience at a point in time when there was very, very little research on the on the conditions. And I wonder how much your own lived experience I allowed you, well, of course, it allowed you to identify gaps um, within every level of patient care. How much did you find your lived experience influence the trajectory of your work with both organizations? I think at the beginning, it did more so. I think the reason that I've been successful and I have turned this into a career and it's grown so well is because actually I rarely draw from my own personal lived experience. And I think that that's the difference in how you can make this a bit more sustainable. I can't represent EDS, 14 different types, very different within each type in, in that spectrum, HSD, 
all those different lived experiences if I'm leading with my own. And so actually my lived experience is right at the back of the line. And, you know, I will draw on it occasionally. And sometimes I relate to people's stories. But actually the, my purpose, my drive, the lived experiences that, that influence and shape what we do is are those that we are hearing from every day from our community, from our community of people living with all the different types of EDS within those different types of the, the spectrum. I think at the beginning when A, this wasn't meant to be what I was doing as a career and B, it was very influenced me starting it because I had this condition, this diagnosis, then it came into play a little bit more. But it also made life much more difficult. You, you're much more susceptible to trolling. People love to hate online. And actually, when I realised that, I realised how much more uh, I could do if I, if my lived experience took a back seat. And that doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I, I much prefer it that way. And I almost forget I have it in the context of my job most days. It's just, oh, you know, people will say, why do, why do you do this? And I guess the answer is originally because I was diagnosed with this, but it's so not the reason anymore. Like it's so insignificant that I have it as, in terms of my purpose. It's how I got into it, but it's not why I stayed. Yes, I love, that's such a great answer. Not that there was a right or wrong there at all, but I, I have found that to be a bit of a theme with people who've wound up working uh, with other people who have EDS or HSD. They might have initially been uh, sort of coaxed that way just from problem solving their own stuff. And then it just took off and, and became its its sort of own its own thing and honestly the first time somebody told me hey you should look into this this thing I thought oh no I saw these photos online it was like back in I don't know 2009 and so there really wasn't much and it showed people stretching their skin like it, it, to such extreme measures that I thought oh that's just not possible like that's not me so it's it's um it is interesting and I also wondered that on account of burnout because once if somebody does lead from their own lived experience as, as uh, a practitioner and someone in your role, that would be quite tiring. So it, it does stand to reason um, that you kind of like place that at the back and that allows you to sort of persevere and go, go forward. Yeah. And yeah. there's a lot of practitioner burnout in all of healthcare, let alone within EDS. Is that something that you've noticed, especially through the pandemic? I have to say that we have the most exceptional group of people working with us and I don't think it's possible for me to feel burnout I'm just so driven and incentivized by what's ahead and the horizon and what's possible that I you know I never say never but I certainly didn't feel burnout um COVID like I said was a constant challenge slash opportunity um to do more and you know every year that passes presents more opportunities we're bigger than we've ever been uh, we've raised more money than we've ever raised. We're doing more research than we've ever done. We're, you know, starting new programs. We're announcing exciting things. Like, how can you burn out with that? Like, not not for me. And I think that the, the key for me, that the biggest challenge I face, where I wouldn't say leads to burnout, is the amount I travel and the pressure of that on my body and remembering, actually, I do have this, that if I don't live my perfect life and I'm doing it in that and my for me personally everyone is different that involves daily movement that involves me eating really cleanly that involves intermittent fasting and lots of hydration and when I get that magic mix together I feel fantastic honestly when I don't I feel like hell and usually the times where I don't is when I'm traveling and that's you know the ir irony is that's the most important time where I should be looking after myself but it takes so much to get up and go to the hotel gym which is actually usually a broom cupboard and and to resist all the the buffets and the lunches and the sandwiches and the carbs and everything that I know my body hates and because there's no other option and and to actually fast when everyone around you is eating you know it's a constant challenge that that I feel the pressure of and I feel the you know the consequences of when I don't look after myself um in terms of the health professionals around us again none of them are burning out they're just so incredibly 
like committed. They do everything for us for free. They volunteer their time. Um, they're outstanding people, and I feel privileged to be able to work with them and that they're my colleagues. So, um, no, no burnout here. I know we we hear a lot here of you know if we get to travel somewhere, whether that's for business, and they're like, oh, you're so lucky you get to travel, and it's 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 such a privilege, um, but it is also very hard on the body. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenging privilege. It is a privilege, and I tell you, during COVID, I missed it a lot. Um, I feel like a lot of people say this, why are you still doing things in person when it was so successful on Zoom? It was successful in many things, but it kind of maintained everything. And there were certain things that did grow, but they were the, they were the virtual things, like the virtual events, the virtual support groups. The in-person stuff, the research, the progression was well managed and maintained. And then as soon as we got back in person, <laughs> You know, the conversations in the elevators and by the water coolers and all, over dinner in the evening. That's where the magic happens. And it really is true, unfortunately. And you cannot replace that in person. You just cannot. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think there'll ever be, you know, running a global organization. I don't think there'll ever be a time where I'm not traveling. Um, I'm trying to make do better traveling. So, for example, you know, I have a one year old daughter now. Um, and I'm usually in the States for most of kind of March, April, May. And so we're trying to be based together in the US for a couple of months and for me to condense down everything in one. So A, I'm not traveling back and forth. B, we can find an Airbnb, settle, cook home meals, you know, and C, most importantly, I get to see my daughter and my wife every day. Um, and just being wiser with those choices and pushing things together and being able to travel with family makes it much more sustainable and that hopefully then won't lead to burnout. Then we are meant to connect, right? Like it's a, we speak to community a lot on this podcast and just having that community and being able to be with the people that, you know, we love and respect and that fill our cups is, is, I mean, that's what I think a lot of people really miss during the pandemic to just not have that close connection. Uh, it's just so vital to, to overall health, no matter who you are. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we've seen even more and more research come about because of, um, I think, because of the effects of the pandemic. There's more and more research coming out of the importance of community, just being able to say hello. But as you noted, um, you know, it is that conversation at the water cooler with somebody that maybe you don't normally work as closely with. And that brings up sparks an idea and uh that that is invaluable that you cannot ever achieve with a booked zoom meeting or something like that now one of the things we recognize eds uh, the eds society is working really hard on is uh, earlier recognition of the the syndromes and so we wondered if there was any sort of development in terms of like pediatrics or changes as far as resources for pediatrics because one of the challenges uh we've noticed is that sometimes with the criteria as they are, there will be practitioners who maybe aren't aware of them, that, that that's the first big hurdle. But then there's also the element to which um, a younger person may not present with all of the criteria. Do you know if there's any development towards developing more of like a pediatric specific screen for people who are, you know, under the age of perhaps 15 or 16 when some other symptoms might become a bit more evident? Yes, it was published last year. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> All the articles. So I clearly missed the pediatrics one. Yeah, it's on our website, pediatric criteria. Now, I think the key is, is that what they decided, the pediatric group on the International Consortium, was that actually um, a diagnosis of EDS wouldn't be given um, at that age. It would be a diagnosis of HSD. Um, but the critical part is a management plan would go in place because it, the diagnosis is less important in theory. We know in real life it's what leads to care and what leads to insurance and all those things, but it should. we need to focus on the symptoms being managed, and that's what they try to do through the lens of that criteria. And it's had good feedback, actually, and a lot more people are using it and being willing to diagnose HSD and get these kids managed and cared for, whereas before there was just this reluctance and then that nothing. So... I think it's been positive. Sorry, in Canada, a lot of people have have uh, reported getting like a bit of a hesitant diagnosis of like, you might have this thing. But then the steps on what to do next are the ones that sort of lack clarity. And I think the earlier in life, you're able to sort of uh, 
step into that management, the better. So it just oh. sets you up for success later on. <laughs> I can I can see yeah. that pattern in a lot of people that we've we've spoken to or or worked with, and I'm no doubt that more pediatric tools <laughs> will only further that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, something in that case is definitely you know better than nothing, right? I feel like a lot of people go in and they have symptoms and they get set ignore, right? It doesn't fit a certain criteria, and so then you're like, no, there's nothing. It's just live with it, right? It's um. That's not acceptable. So I'm really happy to hear that. That's a, a really, a really great uh, step in the right direction. Well, it's nice that it's been, you know, just a year ago that it's already yeah. um, proven to be quite successful. But I feel like everything that the EDS Society has done, including their ECHO program, has been has had pretty pronounced effect, which is uh, mm -hmm. re like really lovely to see because mm -hmm. I, I know that. Uh, it was time, <laughs> a long time ago, actually. Absolutely. Uh, before we, we wrap up, are there any projects uh, happening right now that you would like to shed light on or yeah, just bring attention to? So we have a really exciting project that's going to be announced uh, next week, which is actually going to potentially change the whole landscape of these conditions and life as we know it um, in this world, which I think is needed. And I think has all of this work up till then has been leading to this moment. And that program is called The Road to 2026. And that is leading to a publication much like what we saw in 2017, that's going to be a collaborative effort um, by the International Consortium to produce updated classification criteria um, and diagnostic pathways and hopefully some kind of clinical management uh, papers. So we have, I've actually been in Ghent in Belgium all weekend with our first in-person meeting. We've uh, brought together experts around the table as the steering committee and then the whole consortium will be involved. We're really involving the community and lived experience in this as well. We're going to be holding a webinar for the community on March the second I believe it is and that's an opportunity for everyone to ask questions uh, air concerns hopes fears and everything in between because change is scary right um, you know people are, are concerned what it will mean for them and their diagnosis one thing I can tell you right now is I have no idea what that publication will will say nor does anyone you know there's a, a really important things going on in parallel to this which is going to make that publication possible such as the hedge study looking for the biomarkers, work going on at the Norris lab looking at biomarkers, proteomic studies, epigenetic studies, and lots more in between that we're running. And we're also running the Heads and HSD criteria study, which is looking on a global scale multi-site study at whether these two conditions are one in the same or two different things, and if the criteria is appropriate and what it should be at this stage. So all of those things that are going to lead to published evidence will inform this publication and it will be something that will be groundbreaking because it will hopefully eradicate lots of the grey and it will make it much more black and white and much easier for people to get a diagnosis and clearer for the health professionals as well around the world knowing how to make that diagnosis. So incredibly exciting full steam ahead from us. It's a huge ton of work. Um, you may have also seen that at the end of last year, we uh, got donated a total of $10 million towards research, um, which was just unbelievable and all culminated in the last three months of the year. So my Q4 was an absolute beautiful nightmare. Um, and uh, it was it was insanely busy. Uh, but we're building um, with that a global biobank, a natural history study, um, it's fund. Some of it is funding this. The, the, this whole process, the road to 2026, is costing half a million dollars. It's going towards that. We're funding a really exciting study that I'm not sure will be announced by that by then yet. So I can't give the details. But a really big uh, study in the UK. Um, and more. Check out our sites and socials for when that's fully announced. Uh, that that's I think two and a half million uh, going into that. So look. All, unbelievable stuff and stuff that's going to change things you know it's going to really move the dial and it's a really exciting time uh, to be looking at this field to be in it to be working in it and I hope that that will then cascade down to everybody living with these conditions that will feel this change and this optimism and this hope and this energy that's coming from so many different directions and it is it's a good time. It, you know, it's it's a positive time and things are going to move forward. 
really exciting because that's a conversation I've been having with some uh, colleagues in academia and then also uh, professionally, like clinically, about the diagnostic criteria's evolution. So thank you for sharing that. Those are all really exciting things. And we'll link everything in. So uh, to our listeners, you know, we always link in resources. If we cite research, we link that in. Um, we'll put in your your website, Lara, because um, you do a lot of vlogging that can keep people informed. You do a lot of public uh, speaking, also keeps people informed. And then, of course, we'll put in all of the EDS Society resources and others. Um, if there's anything else, you just let us know and we'll we'll pop it into the actual post itself. Is there anything you would like to add? <laughs> We've got Lara for like maybe three more minutes. Three more minutes? <laughs> well, I, I know we have been asked by people with EDS and HSD how they can get involved in research and surveys. Yeah. Is the best way for them to go to the website or is there anything else you could tell them? Best thing to do is to join our global DICE registry. DICE stands for Data, Inclusion, Collaboration, and Excellence. Um, and it's free to do. And if you're on the uh, registry, it means we can find you and um, offer you to be part of research studies. So that's how people got recruited uh, onto enrolled into Hedge and all these epigenetic studies, proteomic studies, and so on. And then there'll be opportunities to join the biobank with your DNA as well. So uh, get on our website, sign up to our newsletter, be the first to hear all these exciting updates. Follow us on social media. Follow me on social media. Um, it, you know, we're constantly releasing stuff to be excited about. So connect with us. Brilliant. That's perfect, Lara. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure. We're excited to get this up on the website and to help um, raise more awareness for, for ADS. and uh, Related disorders. Related disorders, exactly. Yeah. So thank you so much, and we hope to speak to you soon. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. That's all for today on the Move Daily Health Podcast.